Hello, my name is Farrell D. Moore, and uh, welcome to another episode of Write, when I'm going to be interviewing author A. Karina Spears, the author of a fantastic new book, Helen's Honor. It's really great, and you ought to buy it. There it is, right? <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, A. Karina, what uh, was your original idea behind Helen's Honor? What iterations did you go through until you realized the final draft? Honestly, Paladin's Honor started with the story of Theobald and his fiance. And what happened to them? My friends and I, well, I had just finished the book Love at the End of All Things. And it's a full length novel. It was like on sale for $5.99. And my friends yep. came across something like uh, Taken by the Raptor or something. It's an erotica piece that was 17 pages long 17 wow and they're charging over five dollars for 17 pages i'm like we're doing this wrong <laughs> we're doing this wrong i i put out so many pages i worked for months on that baby yeah so we thought we would try our hand at doing erotica this group hanging up with pseudonyms one of my friends was going to edit it and i wrote the story of what happened to theobald after his fiance passed away and their unusual encounter. They wrote some things, I wrote some things. Some of the friends never got around to writing anything and it sort of got shelved. But, and it was done as the Decameron and I'm like, we're still doing it wrong. Right. So if it ever teases a live day, it's a very long piece and it's based off of the Decameron where you have right. to, uh, the group is being hunted by wraiths and the wraiths drain your happiness, much like the Dementors do. Uh, and they're out of spells and potions to help. So they must use natural methods. So they're trying to tell jokes and things. And they finally have to turn to ribald tales <laughs> to survive the night. Right. And that's what it is. Really? Yep. It's a truth and dare with ribald tales. Well, well, it turned into a fine novel, Paladin's Honor. I got to say this, but, uh, <laughs> but what, was well, the theme, thing. what was the theme behind uh, Paladin's Honor? Well, Paladin's Honor is the outgrowth of the Evolds story, and it became central around his friend Devin. The main theme uh -huh. is that I was noticing a lot of love matches ended in divorce, and but it wasn't necessarily so with arranged marriages. Right. So I did a bunch of research into the background of arranged marriages, the more successful sets. Really. Yes, absolutely. From India to the moon marriages here and try to see that. They're looking at Japan and its history. And a lot of it is families can see from a more adult perspective how their children are. And they've met a lot of people. So they can see who they probably blend with better, even though the children can't see it for themselves because they haven't been around a lot of people. They're looking for long term, even if the child is seeing somebody that's exciting in the short term. Really? Hmm. So this story does not have a true arranged marriage, but it is not a standard love story either. It's a very interesting tale that really? blends these two. Now that um, you put a lot of research into this book, didn't you? Oh, yes. Wow. All right. Tell our audience about the characters and how their lives intertwine throughout the novel. Well, we have Devin, who's a paladin of Rise, and he is a slayer of undead. His whole job is to go around and keep the populace safe, right. along with his order. Right. He met Theobald in the academy. Theobald was felt called, much as Devin was. And the others were going out into the field, but these two were a little younger, weren't necessarily allowed to do the full training so they had Devin had a lot of Theobald's training while the, the uh. older ones were away they bonded very quickly they're only a couple of years apart and so much so that Theobald invited him to visit his family Theo has visited Devin's family over time and Devin right. has visited Theo's family so he's met Mirabelle Mirabelle is Theo's younger sister and she loved hearing about her travels and seeing the maps and uh, hearing about the creatures and the people. And she'd ask all kinds of questions. Of him. And he, she was very enamored of him. But there was nothing romantic. Now, when we get up here, 
mm, Mirabelle's parents, Alaric and um, Daylene, are worried about her. She's running off at night, disappearing. She's not telling them where she's going. She's abandoning her work and her chores sometimes when they're expecting her outside in the yard. And they don't know where she's going, what she's doing. And they are worried that it's going to be an undead because Theo's life revolved around a very tragic thing with the undead. And they expect some rep, uh, repercussions Repercussions for it. Yes, they, he managed to kill a vampire and it wasn't a major vampire. So somebody else made that one and undead rule the area. So that's, that's their great fear. They sent, get Devon to go and look for her. She herself is actually running with the Thieves Guild. Uh, and this is more out of the tragedy around her family and not understanding what, why her brother changed because they were thick as thieves themselves. And then he was away. He just suddenly up and went and joined this order and she barely sees him. And she growing up and she's feeling constrained by her parents and doesn't exactly hold their same views they do with going to the temple all the time and stuff and the thieves guild seems exciting she figures if she's being threatened by monsters she's going to find somebody who can protect her she thinks that jerick at the thieves guild can do that for her so she gets involved with him it's a logical choice on her end more than passionate but it's unfortunate but it's unfortunate he's not a good person per se or at least he's playing at it. He's playing at being king and he's trying things out. And he's talking about things he's heard about, but he doesn't know himself the truth of it. So mm -hmm. he's, he's toying with things and he doesn't have any idea what kind of tragedy he can create with it. Likewise, she doesn't believe that any kind of tragedy will befall her. She's been told what he thinks that the Thieves Guild share women around and it's all good with them. Everybody's happy with it. And she's like, I'm with him. He's the leader. That's never going to happen to me. This stuff happens to her. Oh. She's horrified. Devin is a witness to it. He's horrified. He could not stop it. He witnessed the violation. He, he witnessed the violation and he could not stop it because he's not allowed unless they call for help. And she was stunned. She's so locked in the uh seeing this happen she herself cannot formulate a scream or a cry for help and by the time it's over and it's very brief but the repercussions are much much longer and more lasting however they don't stop here the their lives do not end a lot of stories end with this being taking over this doesn't stop them they work through this and the story builds because mirabelle moves beyond what's happened and finds herself, her true self. She finds out who she wants to be and goes forward, steps forward into the life she wants, not being held back by an instant of unhappiness. That sounds like a great story. I mean, uh, all right, what are the main conflicts that you find weave their way through the story? Honestly, one of the major things that affect the novel is that Theobald wanted to die with his fiance. When she passed, he was visiting her grave during day, but he was sneaking out at night, just like Mirabelle's doing, because she's imitating him. Ah. And he would go and lay on the grave, and it was getting colder. It was getting into the November, December months. Right. And he was still visiting, and the ground is cold. It's not safe to just lay out there. And she was covering for him with her parents, expecting he would, and he was telling her more. He was hiding it from them. He was talking to her. So she thought she would be able to help him work through it. He suddenly had a vision. He ran off and joined the order and she never got her answer. And he wasn't there for her anymore. She was scared by all this too. What happened to her could have, his fiance could have happened to Mirabelle. So what is she to do when there's nobody there? She was finding another protector, but ah. that protector failed her. See, that's the main, main conflict that weaves its way through the story. Mirabelle's yes. search for a protector. Right? Yes, it's Mirabelle's search for a protector. 
And she sees the order of rise and all the other holy orders as shams because they fail to protect her. Okay, that sounds good. Now tell our audience about the setting for the novel and how it plays into the lives of her main characters. And second question, does the setting take on a life of its own? I would definitely say the setting is taking on a life of its own. Really? The more I write, the more characters appear. And the more characters that appear, the stronger all their voices are. This isn't a one shot like my love at the end of all things. That story ended and the characters said, we're done. They, they don't have more to say. This one, there's all kinds of amazing tales in a setting that I very much enjoy because it's a fantasy world. And I have waited and worked to get to write in a fantasy world. Right. I love this place. Wow. So, so, yes. Now, let's see. You didn't say how it plays in the lives of your characters, though? Ah. How the setting plays in your lives. In the, life. the lives of the people here are that of being oppressed. All the people in this entire world are suffering from being oppressed by undead. The undead have taken over. They're not always overt. Now, is the setting gray at this point or the five with colors but they undead are locally locally there's there's color but there is the straining gray of worry that oh. does run through all the world because yeah. they are being controlled and they're being used as pawns in a great game by greater undead are they used as entertainment food? are they mm -hmm. used as food Oh, they're not just food. They're pawns. They're toys and markers for how they send them into battle against each other and mark them up for war. They'll alter them as they see fit. And they just, they enjoy being, tor tormenting them as prey. Wow. That sounds like a grim world setting. But yeah. It I, is. Oh, oh, it it starts there, but in between. They, There's got to be a struggle against that setting though, right? There is. The original world had a conflict with the divines and it caused a great cataclysm across it uh. with the gods fighting and everyone was fleeing. Many of the gods were destroyed or lost. The world was made secure, but then the undead saw their chance and started taking over as the leaders. There's a period of no magic. They were fighting to save themselves in that period as well. Wait, there's a period of no magic, you're saying? Yes, yes. So they're trying to survive off of magical items, draining mm. them down. They had to find a better source and a way to stay alive. And they did. Right. Now, how, uh, does, hmm? how does the dialogue help advance your plot to a successful conclusion? In other words, how does Mirabelle's speaking change and Devon's speaking change throughout the novel? Oh, I'm going to finish the other question a little bit. Sure. Because after that period of no magic, the gods started being able to be heard again, and the prayers of the people rose and helped them form a new alliance with them. And the first thing they needed was protection from undead, and that's where the Order of Rise came from. Ah. So the undead are coming out of sleep and out of other things, but they're coming up against a new threat that they're not ready for. Okay. And that's why the tone's going to go up. All right. Now, how does your dialogue help advance the plot to a successful conclusion? In other words, how does Mirabelle's speaking change and how does Devin's speaking change throughout the course of the novel? Honestly, are a lot of the novel... First? Hmm? Are they veiled at first? Do they speak in um, obtuse ways to each other? Mirabelle does obfuscate more. She's trying to hide her activities and she's trying to deny that a problem exists. I Devin don't. is very straightforward because he's questioning for the family and his order. He's very focused and just trying to see if there's a problem. Because and he's then a paladin, his day. right? Yes, he's a paladin. He's straightforward and honest. Right. He doesn't really change as much in speech per se, but he does find his poet's soul. Good, good. He might do haiku more, but he simply doesn't <laughs> put soul in there. Now, Mirabeau's dialogue does change substantially Absolutely. in the novel, I take it. Yes. She goes from being veiled to being far more open. However, she's on a path to discover herself. 
she goes from her misery out of that and finds that she admires certain people in the town and their lives and wants to be like them. Oh. So That's she's not. stepping forward. She steps forward into her own life. She makes her choices forward going beyond that point. Right. And even then, <clears throat> she remains fiery. Devin remains steady. Yep. But how they talk to each other changes a little bit. Okay. He's more honest with him, but she tends to blurt things out because she can't understand him. <laughs> he was raised in a temple and he has a very formal way of speaking and he listened more than he talked. So he's just not used to it. Ah. Uh. Not used to the fiery interface of Mirabel. He's not. So he ends up asking the priest and priestess their advice because he's trying to court this girl and he doesn't know what to do. Right. At one point, he promised to bring her as many joys as she had tears. And he's like, I didn't know how many tears a woman could shed. <laughs> like, well, you, you did set yourself up there pretty heavy, but <laughs> if anybody can pull it off, it's you because he does have a good heart. All right. Now, could you tell the audience a little bit about your use of detail and color to paint everything throughout the story? Hmm. This has a lot of symbolism in it. So those who enjoy it will be able to find all the Easter eggs. All the oh. orders are, yes, all the orders have very specific flowers and colors and things associated with them that represent what they are right for example the order of rise has purple purple is okay. used for royalty but it's also used for mourning it's the twilight colors it is also that hope before dawn oh yes and the other color they have is the gold of the sun the rising sun it's right. sometimes right. seen as silver also because it's the weaker light of dawn they have the bluet flowers. Bluet flowers grow around graveyards. Oh, really? They are in places where there's disturbed earth. The other things that are in the hair wash and the shampoo, the shampoo, the body wash, all these things, the sense that they have for that order involve protection from un undead and other things. It's got the magical properties. Right. The order of Dido, in contrast, is fiery they're about love and doing anything for love but there's always a price for it okay are you willing to pay the price to be with somebody who's star-crossed with you are you willing to pay the price to be with someone what do you mean by star-crossed if two people are from families that are opposed to the match or in in some way like uh the fault in our stars has one girl who's extremely ill and doesn't have a long time to live the boy has a normal life waiting for him it seems sure. and they don't know how long they have for this love but will you will you get involved when it's going to cost you will you you'll have to let go what price to be together wow dido's group have cinnamon and clove they are considered very fiery flavors but they also act as astringents and clean the skin well so you use, so they protect them from illness. Use all the senses. They do. Yes. Detail. Mm -hmm. And color throughout the story. Use scent, yeah. sense of smell, taste, you know, uh, sight, feel. Yes. Yeah. I will describe you foods. I will describe you the scent of the Mirabelle plums growing in the yard. I will tell you about the flowers. I will tell you about the touch of some of these products because they're using tea tree. If you've never been around tea tree, it's a cooling mint type thing, but it's also a bit stingy. Yeah. So they have all these effects and they talk about them in their own world. Right. Right. Now, lastly, this is the last question. Um, maybe two questions, right? What is the predominant mood of your story and how did you set it? I like to believe that the mood in the story is hopeful. Okay. We have Devin and Mirabel feel like they're going through the motions and they run into each other. It's not the most fortunate meeting. They're, they're butting heads. 
Mirabel's never had to deal with the unhappy Devin. She's always had happy Devin. Right. And Devin's never seen Mirabel in this light because she's grown and she has her own mind and has her own ideas about what she wants. And, and she doesn't she's fiery necessarily, too, right? She's very fiery. It's more so than she was before. She was always outgoing, but now she's got a very fiery disposition. And he's trying to deal with the change in her, and she has to deal with the other side of him. But after things go south for her, and her, she's betrayed by Jarek, and after Devin is forced to uphold his honor at the cost of his personal desire, they both mentally work through their situations and emotionally work through their situations and start taking steps to improve their lives and become the people they want to be in the future. And that future happens to finally be together. And that's how you set the story's mood, right? That's how I set the mood. All right. The so other most fun thing in the story and color is Mirabelle's wedding dress. Oh, because really? it embodies the colors of fall, all the autumn oranges and reds and flaming tones with an overlay of the frost that was coming on in that time of year. So it's the epitome of fall beauty. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, I guess that concludes our interview for today. But uh, next weekend, we'll do another interview with A. Karina Spears, an author of the book, Paladin's Honor. Hold it up so they can see it. That's the back and it's the front. All right. <laughs> there we go. All right, the front of the book. Right? And uh, could you tell us your website, A. Karina, and how you get a hold of you on Facebook? My website is A. Karina Spears. Dot com. Mm -hmm. And you can find me on Facebook as a Karina Spears or a dot Karina Spears. All right. And, and you can also find by, me on Twitter. You're published mm -hmm. by White Cat Publications. Published by White Cat. Which is whitecatpublications.com. Until next Sunday. Goodbye. Bye. Have a wonderful day. You.